I'm Anne Marie Slaughter, the CEO of New America, and I could not be happier to welcome you to the PIA Youth Apprenticeship Summit of 2020. The work advancing youth apprenticeship that PIA does is really at the core of the kind of work that New America strives to do in the world. And it's also a model for that kind of work, uh, as I will talk about. Let me start by telling you a little more about New America itself. We have a grand vision to renew the promise of America by holding the country to our highest ideals in an age of rapid technological and social change. I honestly think that mission has never been more important. We talk about renewing the promise of America. That means the basic commitment that all human beings are created equal and have an equal right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But the idea of renew also means looking backwards and forwards at the same time, taking the best of the past while reckoning and rejecting the worst. So interestingly, if we think about apprenticeship, I was reading recently a new book by Jamie Marisotis, who is the president and CEO of the Lumina Foundation. Um, Lumina has uh, supported New America for a long time. He has a new book called Human Work, and I wanna just read you a couple of sentences from it. This is Jamie talking. He says, I am struck that many of the innovative solutions we will turn to in meeting the challenges we face now look like throwbacks to an earlier age. Apprenticeships, demonstrated mastery, even guilds. Likewise, the kind of human work, uh, the, the kind of life that human work allows us to lead sounds curiously old fashioned. It's a life of meaningful work, continuous learning and service to the community. That is striking to me because apprenticeship is an old fashioned idea. And yet uh, we need to renew it to make it modern, to make it equal, uh, to make it relevant uh, to the life we lead now. But I start with this idea that really apprenticeship and renewing the concept of, of apprenticeship is at the heart of what New America is about. It's also a really big idea. It's the kind of idea that can help us rewire our entire labor market. And that's the scale of idea we need right now. Let me tell you a little more about PIA itself. Uh, many of you know, but not all of you. Uh, we started uh, the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship two years ago in 2018. Uh, and in the intervening two years, we've given nine grants uh, to place-based public-private partnerships. Uh, those grants total more than 1.5 million, and that, those, that 1.5 million are investments in communities. At the same time, we launched the PIA Network, uh, which is a virtual learning community that connects over 45 place-based partnerships across the United States. This is actually dear to my heart uh, as a professor and a scholar. I've been a network theorist for over 20 years and watching the PIA network take shape has been a wonderful example of looking at something in practice that I've long studied in theory. The PIA network total enrolls over 2000 youth apprentices, which is a, is a lot uh, for two years. Uh, and PIA network members work with over 600 employers. And what's important here is that it's 600 employers, not just in the industries that many people associate uh, with apprentices, like the building trades. These uh, industries include healthcare, tech, manufacturing, transportation, education, and finance. Indeed, I remember talking to a PIA member who was talking to me about apprenticeships in insurance benefits and insurance adjusting, uh, an area where you really wouldn't normally expect to see an apprentice. So that is what PIA has really managed to do uh, in its first two years. 
Uh, it is, it, it is ex supporting youth apprenticeship, learning from that support, creating a community of practice, and then has laid the groundwork uh, for this next phase. When PIA was created, however, we could not have imagined just how important working with youth would be. Through this year of the pandemic, we are seeing young people being dramatically affected. Young people who are in school, many of whom, uh, particularly those who don't have access to fast broadband, are at risk of losing a full year of education. But also, of course, those young people who are looking for jobs are now looking for jobs in an economic climate where unemployment rivals the Great Depression. Not the Great Recession, but the Great Depression. That is particularly true in communities of color. Indeed, we risk having a lost generation which is a term that was originally applied uh, in Europe after World War I and World War II and the, the, the number of deaths that we saw across youth. Here, it is much more blighting the prospects of an entire generation. So youth apprenticeship has a critically important role to play. Youth apprenticeship allows us to build a far more equitable recovery. It allows us to tie education and employment together. It's a near-term solution for a great many young people, but with long-term benefits, not only for the apprentices themselves, uh, but at, for the employers and the communities who are now supporting that next generation. Youth apprenticeship is also the right mobility strategy for the long run. Longer term education and training programs are connected to good jobs, are essential for longer term economic recovery. Youth apprenticeship ensures that students do not have to choose between their education and a job. They don't have to choose between taking on debt uh, and a job. And they remain engaged in a program that then will support their longer term economic development, uh, preparing them for full blown careers. The human connection part of this, the connection between a young person and teachers and a young person and mentors uh, in their apprentice capacity, that connection is as important as the income they earn and the knowledge they learn. Connection is what weaves a community fabric, but connections are also a key part of economic mobility. If we just think about our own children and how often we call a friend to make the connection that will land that internship or that job. Youth apprenticeships provide that connection for many youth who would not otherwise have them. Uh, and indeed, compared to peers, countries with youth apprenticeship systems in place see youth employment recover far faster from economic downturns uh, and they don't experience the same lasting and destabilizing effects that, uh, that youth employment has on both society and politics. So this is the moment to expand youth apprenticeship and this summit is all about launching PIA's phase two. Uh, as we move into our second phase, we see all sorts of opportunities for innovation uh, that could then pay long-term dividends uh, for the field of youth apprenticeship more broadly. Um, over this next two years, we'll be supporting community partners in responding to the pandemic, in creating equitable recovery, uh, and in, in responding to rapidly changing conditions of education. We are virtual this year because of the pandemic, but the disruption in habits, long entrenched habits uh, that this pandemic has caused opens up opportunities for hybrid learning of all different kinds and lots of innovation. Uh, and we will be working with communities to accelerate the programs that we've already put in place and to create new ones. 
I have to uh, close by just talking about, again, how PIA works in ways that I think are a model for New America's work, New America, the organization, but also how we, we are all going to work to build a new America. In the first place, PIA combines ground up ideas. We recognize that many of the most important innovations we make in this country are not coming out of Washington or Silicon Valley or any other sort of big wealthy hub. Those innovations are often coming from people on the ground who are working directly with youth uh, or with any other population and figuring out solutions to problems. At the same time, we're looking ground up and we're looking across. We're creating a learning community that allows those people in many communities to share what they've learned. But we're not leaving out government, either state government or federal government. We recognize the critical importance of government to finally get to scale. So PIA works at all three levels, uh, ground up, across, and then bringing in uh, the governmental plane in a way that, again, I think is a model uh, for what uh, Tara McGinnis and I have called the new practice of public problem solving. Uh, and finally, PIA works with partners. New America, nor any other organization like New America, is ever going to achieve scale just on its own. The way forward is through networks and coalitions and alliances and partnerships, uh, where we each bring what we have to the table and we recognize that we have a common goal. And so with that, I'd like to close uh, just by recognizing and thanking our partners and our supporters. Uh, our national partners are Advanced CTE, CareerWise Colorado, Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program Partnership, the Education Strategy Group, JFF, the National Alliance for Partnerships in Equity, the National Fund for Workforce Solutions, and the National Governors Association. And of course, let me also thank our all important funders who are also our partners. We are funded by the Annie E. Casey Foundation, Balmer Group, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Joyce Foundation, J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, the Siemens Foundation, and our two newest funders, and we welcome you to our group, the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation and the Schmidt Foundation. We are so thrilled to have you all. So to everyone, again, let me welcome you to this summit. You are in for a real treat and you could not be doing more important work. My name is Taylor White and I am the National Director of the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship at New America. I've had the pleasure of being part of our small but mighty team PIA at New America since we launched this initiative two years ago this month. First, let me echo Anne Marie's thanks to you for joining us today. The summit is an opportunity for us to celebrate the two year milestone of PIA's work. It's our birthday in some in a manner of speaking. Um, it's a chance to recognize and reflect on the work that partners across the country are doing to advance and strengthen the field of youth apprenticeship. And it's an opportunity for us to expand the reach and ambitions of PIA with you as we head into the next two year phase of the initiative. As Anne Marie said, PIA has always been envisioned as a multi year initiative. But we could not have predicted how much the world would change for ourselves, for our economy, and most especially for young adults when we launched in 2018. Just eight months ago, those in their early 20s were poised to enter into a workforce with record low unemployment during one of the longest economic expansions in US history. In April, the unemployment rate for those aged 16 to 24 rocketed to nearly 27%. And though it's since fallen back down to about 18 and a half nationally, significant racial gaps remain and show no signs of abating. As of July, the unemployment rate for Black and Hispanic youth remained well above 20%.
At the same time, enrollment in high schools and colleges is down considerably as students' priorities have shifted or they've found themselves unwilling or unable to take classes online. In a recent survey of future and current college students, a third of high school seniors reported that COVID has made them less likely to enroll in college. And again, the disparities here are significant. Research released by the U.S. Census Bureau in August revealed that students from families with incomes under $75,000 were nearly twice as likely to report they had canceled all plans to take classes this fall than students from families earning more than $100,000 annually. Nationally, the number of students filling out FAFSA forms, which students um, have to complete to apply for federal financial aid, has declined by more than 100,000 students, with the largest drops observed in rural high schools and those high schools serving large numbers of low-income students. Perhaps most distressingly, as both the public health crisis and our anemic job market continue, more and more young people are voicing significant doubts about the value of post-secondary education. In a recent survey of future uh, and current college students led by New America and Third Way, 70% of high school students said that college is not worth the cost to students anymore. And while the collective faith, our collective faith, and the link between education and economic mobility had begun to waver in this country long before coronavirus arrived, current trends suggest that the recovery will favor workers with post-secondary education and experience, and that the jobs that come back online and continue to grow in the future will too. Already, we see mounting evidence that those with bachelor's degrees and other post-secondary credentials are faring better today uh, in, our, in our labor market than those without. To compete for good jobs in the recovery and build careers over the long term, young adults will need post-secondary options that provide both work experience and structured, low-cost pathways to degrees. Youth apprenticeship is a solution uniquely positioned to deliver on both. If you are one of the more than 900 people who has signed up to join us at the summit this week, chances are you agree with this statement, or at least, at the very least, you're here because you're seeking a strategy to create more affordable, equitable, and reliable pathways from high school to good jobs and college degrees, and you have an inkling that youth apprenticeship might just be it. And if you are in that second category, let me tell you, you have come to the right place. But before we go too far into this opening session, can we just pause for a moment? We'd love to get a sense of who you are and what it is you're here to learn. In just a moment, a poll will flash on your screen, and we'd love for you to take just a moment to complete it for us. So let us know who's here. Are you a K-12 or post-secondary educator or administrator? Do you work in the field of economic or workforce development? Are you here representing a business, a trade association, an industry coalition, or any other group representing the interests of employers? Are you a policymaker? Do you work in government? Are you here because you're an advocate or a researcher? Or do you work in fundraising or philanthropy and have interest in learning more about how to support youth apprenticeship? Let us know. All right, let's see who's who. All right, so we have a lot of workforce uh, and economic development folks on the line with us today, a lot of educators, uh, plenty of folks representing policy and government uh, and business and trade associations as well. All right, so it's a good mix and I see that we have about 300 people who have signed on. Um, we expect to have good numbers throughout the next three days. Um, but exciting to see this diversity of participants here with us today. We have one other poll we'd love for you to answer for us before we fully get started with this morning's presentation. Could you please just take one second to tell us what it is you're most hopeful that you'll have a chance to learn this week at the summit. If you're new to youth apprenticeship and you're curious to just dip your toes in and learn how it works and what its potential might be, let us know. If you've worked with us before or are familiar with PIA and youth apprenticeship, but you're interested in getting a little bit more uh, knowledge about what it's gonna take to launch or grow programs in your community, tell us that too. And if you feel like you are an old hat here, you know youth apprenticeship, and you are just here to rub elbows with other folks that you've worked with in the past, or even perhaps to share some of your expertise and knowledge, let us know. All right, so we have a good representation from folks who are um, familiar with and working with youth apprenticeship, as well as about half of the folks on the line who are um, a little bit newer to the work 
and uh, are, are here to kind of learn, learn what's happening, learn about the potential of this strategy. For those of you who are new, let me first welcome and introduce you to PIA, the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just giving you an overview of who we are and what we do, um, and also talk a bit about how Youth Apprenticeship is uniquely positioned to provide uh, pathways to students that connect them to post-secondary opportunities, connect them to work experience, and can help our communities move towards a more inclusive economic renewal in the months ahead. All right. So as Anne-Marie mentioned in her remarks, uh, PIA is a multi-year, multi-stakeholder initiative that launched in 2018 with the goal of connecting, expanding, and strengthening the field of youth apprenticeship. We support states and cities in their efforts to expand youth apprenticeship opportunities for high school age youth. And we believe firmly that the system, um, sorry, we believe firmly that youth apprenticeship can transform how the nation's education system prepares young people for careers and launching them into it launches them into a successful future. And we believe firmly that this system is long overdue for re reinvention. Though a college degree is now more important than ever to guarantee financial security, it's also less of a sure bet. Students lack affordable post-secondary options and many young graduates find a degree alone cannot guarantee a well-paying job with opportunities for advancement. Even as high school graduation and college matriculation have ticked up steadily since the beginning of the early 2000s, Income inequality and the racial wealth gap have continued to grow, even before the effects of COVID-19 exacerbated both. At the same time, employers have sought ways to build more nimble, more sustainable talent pipelines into fields like IT, healthcare, business services, and advanced manufacturing. But far too often, they are missing opportunities to tap into a rising generation of young, diverse talent, much of which exists untapped in their own communities. Youth apprenticeship is a strategy that better connects the 21st century learning needs of youth with the talent needs of industry. And by doing so, youth apprenticeship can promote a more inclusive economy while also meeting the fast changing needs of American business. This was true two years ago, and it remains true today. But despite this promise, youth apprenticeship remains an underutilized education and training strategy in the US. To help develop the field and advance its transformative potential, PIA has for the last two years pursued three core objectives. We work to improve public awareness and understanding about high quality youth apprenticeship and its potential as a strategy for promoting, promoting a more inclusive economy. And our work generates and disseminates better information about the conditions and strategies that make youth apprenticeship programs successful and sustainable over time. Lastly, PIA has provided direct support to local, regional, and state efforts to grow and improve youth apprenticeship opportunities. In PIA's first phase, our chief goal has been to lay a foundation for the dynamic growing field of youth apprenticeship. Through research, resources, and profiles of innovative programs and practices, we've sought to provide greater clarity to the field about what youth apprenticeship is and could be, and what it will take to scale the model to reach its full potential. Through the PIA network and events like this one, we've sought to better connect the partnerships and innovators launching and leading youth apprenticeship programs across the U.S. to exchange promising practices and support the growth of an identity for the field. And we've provided, as I said, direct support in the form of grants and technical assistance to fuel the work of some of the nation's most unique and promising youth apprenticeship programs, many of whom you'll have an opportunity to hear from over the next few days. But New America does not and could not do this work alone. We are, as our names would suggest, truly a partnership. And our partnership has many layers. First and foremost, we have crucial partners, the community of funders that support this work. Anne-Marie has, has listed them off and thanked them again, but please let me just once again say how grateful we are for the support and partnership and ongoing collaboration with the organizations and foundations on this slide. We also rely on the expertise, experience, and collective networks of the PIA national partners, again, many of whom you'll hear from over the course of the summit. Anne-Marie has already thanked this group of organizations as well, but I would be remiss if I did not once again recognize our partners for their contributions, leadership, good humor, and patience over the past two years. We're fortunate to have you all as partners in our work. As a partnership, we exist to support and connect the work of other partnerships, namely the dynamic public-private partnerships around the country that are advancing strategies to develop, implement, and scale youth apprenticeship programs to create pathways to opportunity in a whole in a range of industries, including advanced manufacturing, the arts, IT, business and financial services, education, and a host of other industries. 
uh, just quickly up here, you'll see a slide with the PIA network in it. We'll come back to this and talk more deeply, um, but know that a big part of our work is supporting the work of partnerships in each of the locations you see represented by dots here on this slide. Within each of those locations, even at the most local level, youth apprenticeship programs rely on partnership. You're getting, catching the theme here, right? Partnership on partnership on partnership. But by design, youth apprenticeship programs rely on the close collaboration of secondary and post-secondary education systems, employers, and other stakeholders that provide critical coordinating and support functions, not only to the apprentices, but to the various organizations that must work together to share the work, share the risk, and deliver values for everyone involved. While there is truth to the adage that apprenticeship must be industry-driven to succeed, these programs thrive and grow when they're integrated within broader education and workforce systems and can leverage the expertise and resources within them. This alignment matters not only for quality, but for the growth and sustainability of these programs over time. And as an added benefit and of great interest to us at New America, these programs can help strengthen the systems themselves by promoting greater efficiency and coherence between them. But do not let this neat triangle fool you. Youth apprenticeship partnerships are rarely so straightforward. In fact, I would venture to guess that across the 49 sites that we support through the PIA network, no two partnerships look alike. And I can verify this for you because some of our team at New America once tried to map them and it was tricky work. What the partnerships in the PIA network do have in common, however, is a shared vision for what youth apprenticeship is. When PIA launched in 2018, we felt it was crucially important for us to develop a clear, common definition of youth apprenticeship to provide direction and clarity to the field. If we're going to expand it, if we're going to study it, and we're going to understand how it thrives, we needed to understand what it was. And so two years ago this month, after significant consultation with our partners and leading practitioners around the country, PIA released the first ever national definition of youth apprenticeship. And it's up here on the slide. Some of the text is a little small, so I'm just going to um, truncate it a little bit for you. Youth apprenticeship programs are structured, work-based learning programs that are designed to start when an apprentice is in high school. And high-quality youth apprenticeship programs typically include four core elements. Those of you who've seen this slide before will know that those four core elements are missing from this slide. And so what we're going to do is pull up another quick poll to fill them in. Let us know which of the items on your screen right now are the four components of a high quality youth apprenticeship program. Well, we'll see how you do. I don't have my Jeopardy music queued up, but we'll give you 30 seconds to, to give an answer here and see what we get. All right, do we have the results of that poll just yet? Here we go. Well, many of you did very well on this test. Uh, all of the above. I don't know if you all knew that or you're all good guessers, but the four core elements of youth apprenticeship include paid on the job learning under the supervision of skilled employee mentors and uh, the programs complement that on the job learning with related classroom based instruction, most often delivered um, through high school CTE courses, uh, through dual enrollment courses offered at community colleges or local universities. Um, it, and at the same time, that learning and the learning on the job is assessed on an ongoing basis against established skills and competency standards. At the conclusion of, of youth apprenticeship programs, students earn portable industry recognized credentials and post secondary credit. And for those of you who know apprenticeship, and it looks like based on our poll, many of you do, these four components are fam likely familiar. They're no different really than the elements that must be in place in a traditional adult oriented apprenticeship program. And that's by design. We know these elements are core to what makes apprenticeship an effective learn and earn model. And we believe all four must be in place to reap the full benefits for young people too. At the same time though, we, we know that simply having those four elements in place cannot guarantee a quality experience, especially for youth whose learning needs differ in some ways than those of adults. And we know too that if youth apprenticeship is going to transform education and employment outcomes for young people, if it's truly to become a mainstream vehicle for economic mobility, some key quality principles must shape the design of these programs. And so along with the definition of youth apprenticeship we've just shown you, PIA developed the following principles for high quality youth apprenticeship. We believe that to be high quality and to deliver results for youth, employers and communities, youth apprenticeship programs must be career oriented equitable, portable, adaptable, and accountable. But what do we mean by each of these? Career-oriented describes the purposeful blending of what's learned in the classroom and what's learned on the job. 
Apprentices can apply what they learn at school, at work, and vice versa. Brain science tells us that this is a good way for adolescents to learn. Teenagers whose dopamine drenched brains crave new challenges and are exceptionally well primed to learn from them thrive in environments like this. And because the skills and competencies they're developing are shaped by what nearby employers need, youth apprentices have an opportunity to develop strong technical and practical skills that make them productive, attractive employees in the future, right away and in the future. Equitable. Youth apprenticeship programs are rigorous and competitive because they can create access to low and no cost post-secondary credits and credentials, but they must be deliberately designed to be equitable. They are embedded within fundamentally inequitable systems of education, workforce, and our labor market. So equity must be at the center of how we think about building and implementing youth apprenticeship. It's important for these programs to both push against and work to dismantle elements of the systems that affect young people's ability to access post-secondary credentials and good jobs. One way youth apprenticeship does this is through the structured mentorship component. We know that teens benefit from structured, supportive relationships with adults, especially adults who are not their parents or teachers. It's one of the reasons athletic coaches are often the most well-liked adults in high schools. These relationships give youth a chance to encounter and try on different adult identities, and they learn what it takes to be seen by adults as capable, competent peers. Especially for students with limited social networks, workplace mentors can expose them to a much wider range of possible futures and help them develop social capital to thrive in a complex and inequitable labor market. But youth apprenticeship programs must be designed to provide and support these relationships, not simply to put young adults in jobs and hope for the best. Equity must be at the forefront of every aspect of the design and implementation of youth apprenticeship programs. The learning in youth apprenticeship programs must be recognized within our post-secondary system. It's important so that youth apprenticeship can be positioned um, as a way to and through higher education, not as an alternative. This is not only important for the programs themselves, um, but for the students who are in them so that they can have an opportunity to gain a foundational education experience uh, on which they can build over time as they advance in their careers. And in today's economy, as I've shared, credentials and degrees matter more than ever for economic security. When industry invests in youth apprenticeship, they're making a real investment of resources and time. And to realize that investment, especially in a labor market where it's unusual to stay at an employer for a decade as it used to be, and the pace of technology means new types of jobs are being created all the time, employers should, must work together to ensure that the learning and skills apprentices acquire through their programs are not narrowly tied to a single employer, but are broadly valued across multiple employers in an industry, sector, or region. In this way, through this kind of collaboration, youth apprenticeship becomes uh, not a short-term strategy for filling a specific narrowly defined role, but a long-term strategy for creating a pipeline of talent for dynamic companies who are looking to build a future workforce in their regions. And in the long run, adaptability is good not only for employers, but good for apprentices too, who have opportunities to thrive um, and bring their talents across an industry over time. Finally, accountable. Youth apprenticeship is unique in that it straddles the worlds of education and work. Successful youth apprenticeship programs rely on the careful and constant co cooperation of high schools, colleges, employers, community organizations, and many other stakeholders. Typically, one of these organizations plays an important facilitation role, balancing the interests and activities of the partners and holding each accountable for the success of the program and its apprentices. Doing so well requires not only clearly defined roles and responsibilities, but also a shared strategy for communicating, collecting, monitoring, and analyzing data to provide ongoing support to apprentices and partners and to ensure apprentices are being equitably served. And finally, to monitor overall program performance over time. We released a set of principles two years ago next week with the important caveat that they are meant to set a high aspirational standard for the field. But it is one thing for me to list them off here and explain why they matter for youth apprenticeships ability to, multi to uh, multiply students options and improve their prospects for the future. Two years ago, we heard from a number of young people who are completing youth apprenticeships through programs that we feel prioritize and, and demonstrate these five principles. Our national partner, CareerWise Colorado, and the Charleston Re Regional Youth Apprenticeship Partnership, a program anchored by Trident Technical College. 
We wanted to see what these former youth apprentices are up to two years later and how the programs that they participated in through CareerWise and the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program have, have set them up for success. Let's take a look. I am a senior in high school and I've been at Home Advisor for about a year and change. And I knew they were gonna be there so I decided to go and so Geotech contacted CareerWise and um, we just got connected and we started talking and we I was able to get the apprenticeship there. I fell in love with that company. I still work there to this very day. I go there during breaks. I always talk to my employees when I'm at school. They're, they're, they're really fun people to be around. They're like a second family to me. Um, but the apprenticeship for me, uh, it wasn't a way, it wasn't another it wasn't a way out of going to college because I still wanted to go to college that was number one on my list to do go to Clemson uh, national champions by the way um, <laughs> uh, I, I still wanted to go to go to uh, college I wanted to get my degree that was number one on my list it just gave me a second way of getting there not every student is going to have a 33 or 32 on the ACT or score really well on the SAT um, I wasn't one of those kids. I wasn't good at taking standardized tests. Uh, so it gave me another way of getting there because I, I was going to do whatever I had to do to get to Clemson. Um, and the youth apprenticeship was something that I could put on my scholarship applica application and on my resume that not all students have. The most exciting thing uh, about the youth apprenticeship happened to me this summer. Um, I came back as an engineering intern. Um, and I was able to make these IRC gauges that we use in in-component um, inspection. I designed two of them, so that inspection for uh, one of my, one of my uh, co-workers named Kip, I made that inspection process go down by like 40%. So it's 40% faster than what it was. And I designed it from using CAD and SOLIDWORKS that I learned in school um, through Trident. I designed it in, in, in NX. Uh, made it on the mill because I'm a certified machinist and then we tried it it worked and I went on and made a second one and they're using them to this very day it's in our system it's things like that and there's not a lot of college students that are 20 or 21 that can be like oh I made this part for my job and made a process faster uh, I have an associate's degree as well um, I have my journeyman's credentials not a lot of kids can say that at the age of 20 and then make $14 an hour in high school uh, and have two years work experience once they leave high school with all these other accolades. Hi, my name is Jude Woltweber. Uh, I was an apprentice with CareerWise Colorado working at uh, Home Advisor. Hi, my name is Valerie Gallegos and I was one of the first students to have been part of CareerWise Colorado during its first launch years. Uh, I'm Mark Walrelek Smalls. I'm from St. George, South Carolina. It's a small town about 45 minutes away from Charleston. Since then, I left Home Advisor and now work for Aetna Digital as a um, software development engineer in test. I actually just finished up my three year apprenticeship with Geotech Environmental this past summer, and I am now currently studying at Colorado State University. Um, although I am undeclared, I do intend to look into a major that has, that is business or, you know, anything that I can apply the past three years. I'm currently a senior industrial engineering major here at Clemson University. And the only way that I was able to get that job and kick off my career was through the experience I got with Home Advisor via uh, CareerWise Colorado. It's just a, such a unique program that I hopefully more people um, are able to join and more students are able to learn about. It just needs to be put out on the floor more often and I was in the Youth Apprenticeship Program back in 2015. I started it my senior year of high school. I deferred my first year of college and I stayed at Trident Tech where I finished out the program and I achieved my associate's degree in machine tool technology. And now I'm two semesters away from graduating from Clemson University. Hi Mark, well it's nice to see you again. It's nice to see you again too, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to since we saw you last uh, in 2018 in DC? Um, 
A good bit, to be honest with you. Uh, when I was in DC, I was still a mechanical engineering major. And here recently in the spring, earlier this spring, I switched to industrial engineering. It was just a better fit for me. I still want to be a mechanical engineer, but I switched to industrial and I plan on getting my graduate's degree in mechanical engineering from Clemson. Cool. So are you finishing up your bachelor's now and moving into a master's or have you started your master's degree? Um, I'm finishing up my bachelor's. I'll graduate next year, December. So December of 2021 as an industrial engineer. And the plan is to move into the graduate program in mechanical engineering that following spring. So spring of 2022. Cool. Is that what you expected when you were with us in 2018? Is that what you expected you'd be up to these days? <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I was, I don't know, ever since I was in high school or maybe even middle school, I always thought, you know, I would get my undergrad in mechanical. But uh, after my time, like my, this is, this past August was five years at Venture. So after my five years at Venture and then moving to one of our sister companies, Kadon, um, and the work that I was doing, I really fell in love with the engineer, uh, industrial engineering style of work and the way their minds think is exactly how my mind thinks. So it was just, a, it was actually really a smooth transition from mechanical to industrial. Um, but I still, like I said, I still want to get my uh, graduate degree in mechanical engineering. Cool. So you mentioned that, that the transition in your major, you made that in part because of your exposure to the different sort of ways of thinking in the job sites that you've worked on. The first company that I know you mentioned was the site that hosted you during your youth apprenticeship opportunity. Is that right? Right. And so then the transition to the sister company, was that part of your youth apprenticeship or is that something that happened afterwards? That was something that happened afterwards, but uh, one of the, one of the people I came in contact with during the youth apprenticeship program was actually uh, the person that set me up with the job at Kadon. So it was, there was still connection there. Yeah, little, you worked the networking then. Right. right. Yeah. right. <laughs> so is it fair to say then that your time as a youth apprentice, like when we saw you in 2018, you had finished that and you had started college. Now it's two years even later two years into college and, and onward, is it fair to say that your time as a youth apprenticeship through the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program continues to influence your career and um, education trajectory? Most definitely. Um, even like back then, I, I think during my time of speaking, when I was in Washington, I stated how uh, I had this instance in class where I had to correct the professor. I haven't had instances like that again, but still that knowledge that I learned from the program still impacts me in like the classroom today. I have, I'm taking, as an industrial engineer, I'm taking two classes and they're, they're not hard classes, but um, they're even easier for me just because of my experience in the youth apprenticeship program. So it's just, it's just coming, coming all back to me, uh, the things I'm learning in that program um, or in those classes. Uh, so yeah, I would have to say it still impacts me today. Like it helped me with my intangible skills skills that I have. So like as far as communicating, uh, public speaking. <laughs> um, <laughs> even by Zoom. <laughs> by Zoom, yeah, correct. So <laughs> like even through like my intangible skills and just communicating and networking with people and being able to work in in a team and be a team player. Uh, so it helped me in like with those intangible skills. But I would stress that don't don't overlook this opportunity to help kids from a background like mine where not a lot of students made it out of my area and could go to like a d1 school like clemson or just a pre prestigious school in general like clemson um the youth apprenticeship program provided students like me with an opportunity to grow out of my conference zone and achieve goals that no one else in their family has achieved so far um and like the money, like the money in the program was good, getting paid. I didn't have to work at McDonald's like my other friends. Um, so all those other accolades came along with it. Uh, even if, let's just say, I don't think this will happen, but <laughs> hypothetically, let's say, you know, I don't want to be an engineer anymore. I still have that machining background that I can fall back on. 
Do you think you'll return to Charleston and, and work in the field there? Or do you have goals to go elsewhere? Uh, so the plan is, the plan is to go back. I wouldn't mind working for the company I worked for as a youth apprentice. Um, I actually just worked there this past summer again. Um, so I wouldn't mind going back. And then we have like all these new manufacturing plants coming in and a big one is Volvo and Volvo is literally 20 minutes away from my house. And I want to move into the automotive industry. Um, so I can see myself working there and I have some people I know that work there uh, that are engineers. But the big goal is to work at Ford in Dearborn, Michigan. And I have a mentor. My first day on the job at Venture, um, the plant leader, the old plant leader, she put me in contact with one of her friends that she went to school with. That's an engineer at Ford. And I've been talking to him these past five years. And um, he's trying to help me get my foot in the door there. So hopefully one of these days I'll be at Ford in Michigan. That's awesome. How exciting. Well, to you, if anyone, if I have faith that anyone can get there, my friend, you are that anyone. I really hope so. That's the plan. <laughs> All right. My goodness. So Judah, who we just heard from, has landed a full-time role in his field at Aetna. Valerie continues to work for the employer with whom she did her youth apprenticeship, Geotech, while studying for a bachelor's degree at Colorado State. And Marquel returned to Venture Aero Bearings again this summer, and he continues to leverage the network he developed there to access new opportunities in the region, and maybe someday beyond. I have to say, if anyone knows uh, folks at Ford, we have a candidate for you. He is wonderful. Kaya's goal for the last two years has been to lay a foundation uh, for a field of youth apprenticeship so more students can have the opportunities that help Judah, Valerie, and Markwell pursue careers and the credential they'll need to advance in their fields in the future. The principles, though, are a key part of Paya's capacity building efforts, but they really are just one piece of a growing arsenal of resource, research, resources, tools, and technical support that Paya National Partners have developed over the past two years to help programs launch, grow, and improve in line with Paya's vision for high-quality youth apprenticeship. This week, we'll be highlighting some of these findings and products in our panels and in the resource spotlights each afternoon. I encourage you to stick around each day to learn more about the tools that can advance your work in the field as a whole. Um, we've also worked over the past two years to support the work of nine grantees who are working to build their capacity to launch and strengthen youth apprenticeship programs and to develop strategies to scale those programs and achieve sustainability over time. The nine programs we've supported with um, grants and technical assist assistance um, are here on the screen and you'll be hearing from many of them over the course of the next couple of days as well, but you can also read about them on our website. The innovation and experiment they're leading as they stand up new programs is important not only to the apprentices, employers, and communities that they work closely with in these cities and regions, but also for the learning of the field as a whole. Next slide, please. And when our, while our goal to advance and expand the field of youth apprenticeship we do not champion growth for the sake of growth alone. We exist to help the field grow coherently, intentionally, and equitably so that it's learning and improving while growing and doing so in a way that expands opportunity and intentionally dismantles barriers to uh, education and employment. The PIA network has been perhaps our most important vehicle for facilitating this learning in real time through webinars, events, office hours, and national work groups hosted and led by some of our national partners PIA provides technical assistance and facilitates the peer-to-peer -peer exchange of best practices. Now nearly 50 partnerships strong, the network has been an important resource for the field as partnerships across the country have adapted to the changing educational and economic conditions in response to COVID-19. In its first two years, the PIA sites we support through the network have accomplished far more than this slide would suggest. We've worked with partners to build a national network committed to a shared vision, definition, and strategy for expanding youth apprenticeship in America. We launched a national research and communications agenda that yielded more than 30 individual products over just 18 months. And we've invested over a million dollars in nine communities to support the development of partnerships and 
strategies necessary to sustain and scale up youth apprenticeship programs in those communities over time. With our support, those programs have created hundreds of youth apprenticeship opportunities and now enroll collectively more than 2,000 youth apprentices. They've expanded, expanded employer networks, brought youth apprenticeship to new industries, such as early childhood education and aerospace, and they continue to share what they're learning about this growth with others. Beyond the grantees, the PIA network has grown to nearly 50 members, as I said, all at different stages of their programmatic evolution. Counting their apprentices, employers, and industries, the numbers on the screen could be even greater, and you will have a chance to learn about some of their successes over the course of our next three days together. Over the past two years, PIA has learned a great deal about the about youth apprenticeship. We understand uh, now, both through the grants competition that we hosted in early 2019, and also through the number of folks on the line at the moment, as, as well as our um, higher than expected RSVP count for this event, we know that the demand for youth apprenticeship is broad and deep, even despite, and per perhaps even more so due to COVID-19. We now understand that programs at different evolution, at different stages of their own evolution, require and demand different types of support. And though we know that PIA's definition and principles have been important for driving alignment and consistency across programs, partners, and strategies in the field, we know that those strategies still vary considerably. And we have a lot to learn about how partners work together to define the work that they do and set goals for themselves as they work to become bigger, better, stronger, and more sustainable over time. And finally, we've learned, and it's quite clear to us, that the stories, data, and policy work that PIA leads will really matter in the future as programs across the country strive for scale and sustainability. These lessons will inform and shape much of the work PIA will lead over the next two years. Our next phase comes at a time that is critically important for elevating and addressing the needs of youth in a time of economic uncertainty caused by the COVID-19 crisis, not only in the communities we've worked with to date throughout phase one, but beyond the PIA network as well. Now more than ever, as we've, said, we've discussed, young people need access to post-secondary education and economic opportunity. And PIA and Youth Apprenticeship is well positioned to help communities adopt the strategy for promoting an inclusive economic recovery. In PIA's first two years, we've been focused on laying a foundation for the field. Our next two years will focus on accelerating the growth and improvement of high quality youth apprenticeship opportunities to address the acute needs of youth and employers in this moment and into the economy of the future. Even amidst the uncertainty unleashed by COVID, we have set an ambitious goal for the field that by 2025, there will be 10,000 youth apprentices in the United States to enjoy opportunities like those that Judah, Valerie, and Markwell have shared with us today. While this is still a relatively small number compared to the huge apprenticeship systems in Europe, it would represent tremendous growth in the U.S., both in terms of sheer numbers, but also in terms of the economic opportunity it would create for young people and their communities. But while this is a powerful benchmark for expanding participation, expansion for expansion's sake has never been highest aim. Youth apprenticeship programs must support equitable outcomes for students and deliver results for sponsoring employers. To ensure they do so, PIA will, in our next two years, continue advancing our vision for quality, equity, and accountability by leading robust communications and research strategies that elevate the voices of industry champions, education and workforce leaders, and youth apprentices in this growing field. To support the work of place-based innovators, we will continue to reinforce best practices, develop tools to strengthen and scale programs, accelerate new initiatives, and build evidence to advance the field. And finally, to help communities around the country continue to build the dynamic place-based public-private partnerships that make youth apprenticeship possible, PIA will support a growing number of sites with strategies to bring youth apprenticeship to new industries and new communities. By continuing to test and support the implementation of local and regional efforts to build pipelines of skilled talent in crucial fields such as healthcare, IT, education, transportation, and infrastructure, PIA will ensure that the communities we support through the network will emerge from this global crisis more resilient than ever. But while we have learned a great deal over the past two years about what makes youth apprenticeship successful, we still have a great deal to learn about what it's going to take to rapidly accelerate growth in the field to hit that 10,000 goal and ensure that the programs and systems that support these, them can become sustainable over time. 
And this learning, both the learning that's occurred over the last two years and the learning that's ahead for PIA, is what brings us together here today on this gray, cool Tuesday in October. While we'd always planned to convene a large group to celebrate this milestone in our learning and our work, the economic uncertainty caused by COVID and the stark inequities the crisis has both revealed and exacerbated means that youth apprenticeship in the work of PIA has taken on even greater importance as a strategy for promoting economic recovery. And so, over the next three days, you'll have an opportunity to engage in conversations with apprentices, employers, system leaders, and other experts who understand how youth apprenticeship works and what it takes to make pro sure programs are high quality and equitable. You will hear from educators, CEOs, and philanthropists who are all committed to advancing more inclusive economic growth through youth apprenticeship and in working together to do so. We cannot afford to another lost generation of youth. and We do not have to. Youth apprenticeship can provide access to more affordable post-secondary learning options and expand economic opportunity in the uncertain economy in which we now find ourselves and in the brighter future that lies ahead. This is the belief that lies at the center of PIA's work. Thank you for joining us this week to learn more about the initiative, to celebrate the progress we've made to date, and to ask and answer questions about many of the topics on your screen right now. Topics that will be central to the second phase of PIA's work, which we are proud to be kicking off with you here today. Now, before I wrap up and let you on to the first panel discussion of the conference, I want to say just a, a few quick thanks once again to our funders for their ongoing support of the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship, to our national partners for the work that you do to support the field and support us at New America, and to my uh, colleagues and friends at New America, Mary Alice, Brent, Elena, Rule, Joyce, thank you so much for that video, Riker, Fabio, Hanna, Aunt Angela, Narmada, Jason, Shannon, and the folks from across our organization who make this project successful and will be behind the scenes in various ways this week, making sure everything goes smoothly. We could not do this work. We would not do this work without you all. So thank you for making this journey possible and a whole lot of fun.